Good morning. Rice is in our midst. Ready? Oh, I cannot hear you. One more time. Christ is in our midst. Much better. How much I love you. It's the Orarian pump. Anybody can say that? How much do I love you? As much as driving nine hours from San Francisco to be with you today. But really, it's not a matter of hours. Because I was very thirsty to come and see your beloved faces. Not only because of the two years of pandemic, but also before that. It is very difficult sometimes to be connected with the people that you love, to be connected with those who are fruitful servants in the vineyard of the Lord. And this is what I like to share with you in, in the, today's homily, my beloved brothers and sisters in the Lord. Because we live in time of tentative fixes of complex conditions. Wherever you live and wherever you stay, there is always some kind of condition that is going on. Perhaps this is how it always has been, but I do not think so. The today's situation, not only in this country, but in the whole world, requires us and you, all of us together, as an ecclesia, the gathering of the people of God, to be a little bit more mindful of our condition. It seems that in the past, there were more cures for conditions than there were today. We could say that as life in this world becomes more divergent from the life of Christ and his gospel, the less of a cure there is for the maladies of life. And rather, the more there are treatments which may or may not help. There are treatments for many different maladies, but you don't hear about the cures. You may know of someone or even yourself who suffer today from a condition which may be helped by modern medicine, but not cured. Of course, sometimes the treatment is worse than the malady that it treats. In reality, <clears throat> the modern era, as the younger generation calls it, the post-industrial era, is not the first time that humanity has suffered from chronic illnesses. The today's gospel reading about the woman with a chronic hemorrhage, suffering from it for 12 years, spending her life savings on doctors and treatments, but not cure. Sadly, this woman could have been living today, and yet with all the modern advances in medicine, may not have been better off. She encountered Jesus with her last hope. She had nothing else in the world to be able to help her. Nothing else worked, but she heard about Jesus' ability to cure people's illnesses, not to treat. So as there was a large crowd, many people pressing together towards Jesus to hear a word, to receive a blessing, to learn about him and form him. Many people pressing about him, yet this one woman who touched the hem of his garment with the faith 
Even just doing that would be enough to cure her. She believed on that. And it was. And it caught Jesus' attention. He said, someone touched me. I felt power flow out from me. Specifically, this woman, despite many pressings about him, he identified her. Indeed, it was healing power that flowed from Jesus. The woman came forward and confessed it was her, and as Jesus said to so many whom he cured, he said to her, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. A powerful statement for the ages until the second coming. The faith that abides in you and me must be a real faith, a sincere faith, a loving faith, a faith that changes the world. Not simply yourself, but everyone around you. It is from this account that the pious tradition of touching the priest's vestment in the great entrance began. You saw the priest today and the deacons coming around. Many times, pious people come forward and touch in the hem of the priest. If I can but touch the hem of his garment, I will be made well. I will be cured. That's what that woman said. We may like to think that we have this kind of faith, but do we? Faith comes from hearing the word of God. The unique ministry that you saw the many deacons today here, of the deacons, has as its focus leading the faithful in prayer, reading the gospel, among other things. But the faith they proclaim, the faith that you receive, through the sacraments of the church, it is that kind of of precious testament that God, God and Christ gives you. Those here today whom God has called through his grace to serve the people of God in the office of the deacon, one which we tend to underutilize, they have that responsibility to proclaim sometimes with a thunderous voice like Father Stephen's voice and Deacon Dan's voice. They are thunderous. The faith of Christ, the faith in Christ. Thus, you are a special blessing, my beloved deacons who are here today, to the parishes which you serve. For those of you who may not know why there are so many deacons here today, it's because we have a, had a gathering of the deacons to be able to, after the, during the pandemic situation, to share the experiences. There are many others as well who came to your beloved Paris who are intending to become deacons. I see here one community, one family, who's uh, the head of the family. He wants to become a deacon. He comes from all the way from Maui. But there are so many others. Why I'm underlining today's homily about the diaconate is because serving Christ professes the faith that you and I have to profess on a daily basis. Too often, we think of ministry as being confined to the priesthood as such when in reality the ministry of the church in its various levels it's healthiest when it is shared. Besides priests and deacons, the lay people sharing in the ministry as well, as we call to mind today that your community celebrates or commemorates 
as the Philoptochos Sunday, the ladies of the Philoptochos. But there are so many other blessings that you, the communicants of St. Paul's here in Irvine, have brought forth in many different capacities that I come to see and, and partake of it today because you are, with your actions, your works, as an ecclesia, as a gathering of the people, professing and make an example of the faith in Christ, the one that the woman today confessed and made it well by her own faith. Last Sunday we were, along with some of my brother bishops and other priests and also few of you in New York City where His All Holiness, our ecumenical patriarch, celebrated the liturgy at the cathedral in New York. He made, he prayed for the archons of the ecumenical patriarchate, the new class of archons that we do as we do every year. Few of your communicants here have been in archons of the ecumenical patriarchate, the Order of St. Andrew. And we were proud to add another archon of a member of this community this past Sunday in the presence of His Holiness, the ecumenical patriarch. Steve and Eve Tibbs are not unfamiliar and unknown to you. They are both of them, in their own way, humble servants of God. They are exemplifying, like you do in your own way, the faith that has to be alive on a daily basis. The ministries of the church, my beloved brothers and sisters in the Lord, as ministries, multiplying the church and in the world the healing touch of God's grace to make the broken whole, not just to treat, but to cure. In addition to sickness that are treated expensively but never cured, we have illness more profound than the physical ones. Allow me to refer to Bishop Augustinus of Florina of blessed memory. He recognized that the hemorrhage the woman struggled with is a representative of the condition of humanity, of our own condition, suffering perhaps not with the prior to Jesus' incurable hemorrhage of blood, but suffering because of sin. He said, one person suffers from anger and wrath. A second suffers from avarice and greed. A third suffers from a sensuality that pushes him into fornication and adultery. A fourth suffers from gluttony. Self-conceit, hatred, laziness, and so on. We all hemorrhage the very life out of us because of our own particular sins. We all must come to the Lord for the cure or our suffering is in vain. These past two years, if has not become a clarion wake-up call for us about our faith, nothing will. If the suffering of the world becomes objectified of the left or of the right of our political leanings and do not see the spiritual aspect of this suffering, nothing will wake us up. Perhaps, just perhaps, as we were reminded in last week's epistle, 
like St. Paul, we are forced to suffer physically and let God's grace suffice for us. Let God's grace become that balsam that wake up the faith in real time. In today's epistle, we heard from St. Paul again, zealous to maintain the traditions of his fathers, gave all up his own heritage and inheritance to follow Christ. While as Orthodox Christians, we all are called to live lives in Christ, letting go of the unredeemed aspects of ourselves, the old Adam, to be joined with Christ, the new Adam. It's very difficult. But my question to you and me, my beloved brothers and sisters in the Lord, until when? God has given us many signs the last two years. Christ has healed people out of nowhere. So we think. When you sacrifice of yourself for the Lord's work, and sacrifice not under conditions, by the way, and here we mean specifically the Lord's work of ministering to others, materially and spiritually, whether as lay people or as clergy. The deacons or Steve Tibbs, the archon now of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, and every one of you, you are charged with bringing the blessing of Christ to others. That is your marching orders. You receive his precious body and blood you have it within you. That is the grace that it suffices for you to change the world. Let us all be cognizant of what the Lord has entrusted to us. This pandemic era historically has turned the whole world upside down, but not for us. Through this particular travel, God has given us a roadmap, a blueprint to his kingdom. Let us recognize that blueprint. Let us see the opportunities to be a blessing to others. Let us especially see the opportunity both in service to others, but first in service to ourselves, to look to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with faith, to cure, not to treat, to cure the maladies of sin that it may be uprooted from our souls and our lives. Amen. Amen.